Hello, hello. Um, we are live on Facebook and uh, YouTube at this, as we speak, and we have with uh, Crystal. This is an unscripted live. We, this is uh, something that has not been planned. There is no script, nothing. We just want to speak our heart. Let. Uh, Crystal, would you uh, start? Well, first, I just want to start with prayer. Mm -hmm. First, Father, in the name of Jesus, we do thank you for all things. We thank you that today is the day that you have made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. And most importantly, Lord God, we know that nothing happens by chance or coincidence. And Father, all the unrest and uh, different issues going on in the heart of America on tonight, we just ask for your wisdom and your guidance um, and your understanding, Lord God, to, that would bring hope to many, many lives on today in the name of Jesus. Those are hearing the broadcast live. Those will hear the replay. We pray, oh God, that something that will be said on today would bring forth a sparkle of hope and encouragement in the lives of the hearers on today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Those are hearing the broadcast live. Those So, mm -hmm. I guess I'm going to kick this off. Um, we were talking today about racism in America, and we have myself, um, Crystal, Harold from Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, and Lester from Texas. And there's some civil unrest all across the nation, and we just want to give a heart's perspective um, today, um, I'm from Florida, like I said, and and yesterday started a a mountain of protest and um, some unrest here that hit our my footprint and has put hit the footprint of so so many different um, states of America. So we just want to take a fresh perspective and look at racism in America. Um, what we can do. Um, let's have an honest conversation. What can be our call to action? Um, maybe some of the root causes and what is really, really going, what is really, really going on? And how do we move forward? And some practical, some practical um, steps of how we move forward. How do we heal from this, uh, this crime against all of humanity? It's not about a white or black issue. Um, racism hits so many different nationalities all across the board. So uh, I don't want to just talk about black against white, but this is a, a monster against all of humanity. All different nationalities have experienced racism in some form or fashion. And some of us, some of us have been connected um, to it directly affected or indirectly affected and so we just want to have some honest conversation my my brothers here on the line they are uh, from Cameroon Africa and for um, a citizen that was born here in America as an African-American sometimes um, our viewpoints might be a little bit different but it doesn't mean that we cannot um, take up one another's plight so I, I want to hear, just ask a question to the brothers on the platform about, um, you know, their viewpoint of racism here in America. I know they have been in America for different points of time, and I grew up here, so I, I've, I've seen probably just a little bit more, but nevertheless, um, their heart is... Uh, against injustice so i just want them to take a few moments to describe maybe their viewpoint or their if they had any personal um encounters with this this the monster of racism i'll go with uh lester first 
Yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, uh, Pastor Apostle Christian. Uh, before we start, we really want to uh, address our condolences to uh, George Floyd family. We have mm -hmm. seen what's happened, and it's, it's really sad. It's a heartbroken situation, and this is the reason why we thought that we have to address the problem of racism in this nation. And especially when you listen to what uh, the former speech that uh, George Floyd said, he was really a peaceful guy, a true believer, and uh, he was given a lot of advice. And it is sad that uh, at the end, he's truly victim of what he was scared about. But nevertheless, we, we, we saw all over the nation, people went on the street mm -hmm. to protest. It is normal because when you see what has happened, it's beyond an act of racism. I mean, you cannot explain mm -hmm. you cannot explain it's evil at mm -hmm. a certain level it's evil and uh, being a black and being in this country for a while is something we know and it is only that uh, the way they react is a little bit sometimes different you know whenever you you are stopped or pulled over by the police I always have in mind that everything can happen, you know. And uh, when I came in this nation, they taught me about it. So the way mm. I react, the way I uh, do things, uh, sometimes is completely different. Mm. So we'll have to wow. go through it tonight and talk about uh, many other aspects and uh, I believe that at the end we're we'll trying to, uh, according to what we think, how we can not suppress, but at mm -hmm. least lower it down, those acts of racism. Because as you said, it's not just between black and white. You know, mm -hmm. Spanish, they are victims at their level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indians, they are victims at their level, you know. It's a, it's a pandemic, if you can call it like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A true pandemic. <laughs> and it's yeah. one that has been, um, has been going on for a long time. Well, I'm very, I usually don't like to speak when I am emotional. Um, I personally, um, as a way of life, when I'm hurt, when I'm moved, mm -hmm. I don't talk about it. I don't say anything because usually um, what I've learned is that uh, personally, when I react to something, my reaction all most of the time is wrong but this time you know when i, I started watching that video um i i stopped i paused i couldn't watch it all the way to the end you know now you all know me i have been so much advocate on police you know, i am the son of a of the of a of a police officer so I understand uh, the importance and the role of the police in the society. But uh, what the world, the entire world, you know, all the television around the world that is, is showing that image is... Hmm. It is... Uh, I had no word. I didn't know what to say. Um, I was shocked. And I had to stop. I couldn't watch it. I'm still extremely emotion, emotional uh, 
given what is going on. I have never been blinded by the reality of racism in America. And I always say, I used to say that um, personally, I've never been this moved and touched by the racism like this this situation and and also always say that I don't expect men and women to like each other you know uh, I I am commanded from my faith to love even my enemies but I don't expect everybody to love me you know I, I don't put my mm -hmm. place in a shoe where I want people to love me you love me, you don't love me, it really don't matter. You you like me, you don't like me, it's not a problem. But uh, mm -hmm. when it gets to the point where you can take someone as a life, mm. that becomes a very, very deep, 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 deep problem. You know? And my, my, my fear here is there's that not everybody have the maturity not to react to pain pain mm -hmm. create reaction are we ready are we prepared mm. for to the reaction that such thing may cause in the whole land now as a black man racism in all over the world and even to this point i always say that uh, lister over and over that america is the best place for a black to be on the face of the planet period but as mm -hmm. black we are facing racism all over the world less in america thank god we have cameras we have live streaming all those things now we have the mean to see deeply what is going on but he has mm -hmm. always been like that yeah it, it is it is he has been like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um my take on this my very deep concern the only thing that ever shocked me was racism within the church i can understand racism uh everywhere else but i could never understand racism within the church i couldn't understand mm -hmm. how someone will carry the bible preach the bible claim to believe in christ and being racist that i never this is the, the big shock that i had when i came i knew there were racism but even in the church there is racism, there is racism everywhere and what is mm -hmm. unacceptable is within the church is within the church we have racism within the church mm -hmm. and and i believe the the responsibility i would have expected white male pastors to be more vocal about racism than anybody else this is my personal <laughs> shock when i moved to america you understand um mm -hmm. uh, I've been to so many churches and I've never heard a message against racism. Mm. Sunday mm. is still the more the, the number one segregated day. I mean this is the the racism is well expressed on Sunday than any mm -hmm. a, a, any other day of the week. And this is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have we we are silent. What are we preaching? What are we preaching? All the killing cops, the people co perpetrating all these things, they are going to some churches. Most of mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. You know, I have made some personal investigation. I, every time there is a killing, I was trying to know if the men involved in those were going to churches most of the time yes they do sometimes they do mm -hmm. go to churches 
when I say church, I'm not saying not every every church. We have some churches who have tried and doing some very good work about mm-hmm. it. But I'm talking about the mainstream, about like the the the, the median, the average. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where the problem lies. Because I don't believe politician will ever solve this problem of racism. It's not possible. Mm-hmm. Election would not solve the problem. That in uh, that I mean, I mean so the the governor is a, I mean, let don't talk, don't let not talk politics, but politics cannot solve it. We had we we have tried the politics; it didn't work. We voted a black president; it didn't work. Governors black, you know, everybody, it didn't work. It's the problem of the hearts of men, and right. only mm-hmm. Jesus can change this. And if the church does not provide the balm of Gilead, the real transformation that the word of God is supposed to bring into the heart of man, this problem will never go away. It is deep rooted into the DNA of most Americans and most white That's Americans. True. And it's only if we embrace the grace and we accept God to transform our heart that we have we can see a difference but if we don't preach about it if we don't speak against it and nothing's gonna happen Jesus said Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Paul said that how are they going to be saved if no one is preaching even salvation is subject to our preaching that's right so racism is waving the voice of the church the anointed mm-hmm. voice of the grace of god to provide mm-hmm. healing from generations people have been slaves over the land the blood of the innocent blood is still crying the voice of the church must be heard a sunday like this where people are you know happy to go to church seriously this could be a day where the real protest could have been done by the church. We say, okay, well, we 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 go in the street to peacefully protest. It's just an idea because we don't do anything about these civil matters. Hmm. When I say I say, you know, we still have some exception. So, you know, I don't want to to take all the time because most of the time when I speak, you know, I'm on, I'm not scripted right now. I'm just <laughs> emotional. <laughs> Crystal, I don't know if I, uh, um, you know, I am making any sense of, uh, but uh, uh, this is I, what I can say. I, I believe you're making <clears throat> per- perfect sense. I, I do want to add something though, um, in regards to the response from the church. We have to first to realize that it's not a african-american church is not a caucasian church is not mm-hmm. a korean church it has to be a universal response mm-hmm. from the church across the board and i you know back in the the early 60s um when we had so many great voices you know one in particular dr martin luther king he was on the the forefront and the church backed him they did great protests. They did, you know, silent protests. They did love protests. They did all of those things. They they backed their beliefs and their protests by prayer and by action. They weren't silent. They were they were very active um, in calling forth uh, different um, laws to be changed, stuff like that. And I believe we were onto something very very great there. I'm not sure what what the disconnect happened from the the 60s until now. I mean, we've have had some strides in in progress. I'm not saying that we haven't, but above all, um, even our nation's Declaration of Independence declared, you know, even from our forefathers when they gathered together and they was you know, going away from the persecution of England, they said, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. 
all men are created equal. And, you know, they came under that pretense to, to, to build what we call the United States of America now. And there has been a disconnect from that um, deparation to, you know, the, some of the stuff that we have now. But one thing I will say is that we cannot downplay um, what has happened to nationalities here in, uh, in America or in all over the world, but we're, we're speaking about America now. We can't downplay the plight of people and just expect for it to, to go away. Um, there has to be some real leadership, some real reconciliation, some real acknowledgement of some things that have gone down under the watch of America. And by far, I don't think that um, we have made some great strides, but I think in some instances, it hasn't been and i agree with you that how can how is it possible that um you know the church is segregated on sundays and leaders don't require um integration i mean that's what our, our ancestors was fighting for in the early 60s integration of restaurants restrooms um businesses and so you know um i think it goes to leadership we have to have a voice and not be afraid to confront. And I'm afraid what has happened is that the progress that we started, um, you know, our, sis our ancestors started back in the 50s and the 60s, um, the baton was dropped between generations. And so now we are having our, you know, the millennials and our children to fight battles that we should have uh, won. We should have we have we should have taken it all the way. We should have taken it to the finish line, and so now we see a lot of the civil unrest right now um, that is plaguing plaguing America all across the land. And you know their voices want to be heard, but we have to first identify and identify that their their trauma is real. What they have experienced is real, and then how do we heal from that? So. I would like to talk about um, the current state of the church or the current state of you know, racism, where we are and where we go from here. And I know it won't be all solved in one platform, but I, I think we're doing a start about having an honest conversation. And I, I would like to even say, I want um, other religious leaders to come to the forefront, use their platforms, use their social media voice, use their Instagram, their YouTube, their, 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 um, their Facebook, use their, use their, their mm -hmm. electronic voice to immobilize people, to mobilize first their congregations and then mobilize people in their communities to make a difference. And let's, def let's, uh, make some strides and defeat this, this, uh, monster once and once once for all once you know forever so um, any one of you can chime in about you know the current state some of the you know the causes and, and then we'll go to a call to action what does what does practical action look like going forward from day to day where people are scared um, we have black people scared we have white people scared we have all different nationalities scared to leave their house, or if they see a particular skin color, then automatically their defense is to call 911 over nothing. So where the where do we go from from here? So either one of y'all can start, Pastor. I mean, Lester, I want to hear from you um, in regards to the current state of where we are, and especially in the church, before we go to the call to action and what our response should be. Thank you, Pastor Crystal. Mm -hmm. Yes, Pastor Harold, as you introduced, talking about the failure, if I can call it like this, or the racism in the church, uh, I had to think, I thought about it a little bit. But, um, you know, uh, here we have many types of churches, African-American churches, Nigerian churches, uh, Cameroonian churches, white churches, uh, <laughs> cowboy churches. And uh, 
if at a certain point they can understand why people they gather sometimes together for the fellowship i think it's because of the culture during the worship so what i'm saying is this uh there are some people who never feel uh as their ease if they go to african american churches because during the worship many will be singing dancing going up and down you know uh, if you have been in methodist churches the most of the time when they are singing praising they don't make a lot of noise and uh, they feel comfortable that way i'm not let me let me make the point i'm just explaining why some like some people like to fellowship at or in some churches why some white people they feel comfortable to fellowship in the white community i, do, I don't want to no cover the fact that behind racism can exist because pastor arol explained it very well by mm -hmm. saying that uh, you cannot be safe except somebody has preached the gospel to you it's written in the bible how can they believe except someone preach mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's true that beyond this problem of places of fellowship uh, as we have discovered also by noticing that in the churches for example very few preach about sanctification means people who come to the church and go back and live their life from monday to saturday <laughs> in any mm -hmm. type of way of mm -hmm. behaving and coming back to church on sunday just because they have never addressed the problem of sanctification on the pulpit so i believe as pastor all said that this problem of racism the church also they have never addressed it addressing in the way that you know the bible says that the believer has to be the light of the world the salt of the earth light means that wherever you step you have to shine you have to be noticed you are not noticing or they don't notice you by what you say but by the way you believe or you behave if you have to say that i'm a christian for people to notice that you are christian it means that there is something wrong somewhere Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So what I'm saying is this, church had never addressed the problem and I think this is the time for us to address it because in heaven there is no white, no black. Mm. There is no Asian, no Spanish. You know, we have seen many people who have received uh organ transplant when you receive an order god uh, a transplant whether it's kidney or whatever you don't ask they don't tell you whether it was from a black or for a white whether it's from an asian or a a spanish because all those organs are the same so I think that with the situation in which we are living right now, uh, that many they feel oppressed by people hmm. of other colors, churches mm -hmm. have to step out and to address the problem. Because That's right. we know that this is a Christian nation. It means that many, they go to church some have become uh on churches but yet they still have that faith in their heart means is the problem is addressed at least 
they will have heard. At least they will have heard. And faith comes by hearing. It means that by hearing and hearing and hearing, finally they have to start to believe. So I no. believe that uh, church has to address the problem. Church has to address the problem. Church has to address the problem. All because right. Uh, <clears throat> Crystal, go ahead, Pastor. Now, yes. as a woman in America, um, black woman, you know, I mm. have been told many times that we Africans don't really understand the struggle of African American, that uh, we behave as um, uh, <laughs> that we are not really sensitive to racism and uh, we don't understand um, the struggle. Uh, talk to us about that. What what, what do you? Um, that's a general. Personally, I was I, I was uh, told that you know. So, what is it? Well, I I would say that um, that that is a factual statement. Um, mm -hmm. You know, truth and facts are two different things. So. Mm -hmm. I would say that that's a factual statement and I have been privy of that same um, information and and I think from that perspective there's sometimes even a disconnect between the African American and the African that came from um, you know the different uh, countries in Africa you know on the continent of Africa um, and and sometimes you know it sometimes it can be overcome i mean you know you you and my brother here on the platform y'all from cameroon and i love y'all dearly and i have a lot a lot of african friends as well as african-american but i have a very a host of african friends that are from different um countries different from the continent of africa and um, they have totally, totally enriched my life, um, to say the least. And, um, you know, as I would say that the perspective from being a African-American male in America and an African-American woman is totally different. Our plight is different, you know, going all the way back through, uh, you know, I don't want to give a history lesson, but going all the way back through slavery and the, and the family was, disconnected, which, um, you know, the males were put one place, the women were put another place. And whereas, you know, um, true born Africans, y'all are very family oriented, you know, from what I have noticed. Um, that is correct. Very family oriented. So to come to this side of the Western hemisphere where it is not like that, and most um, African American, a lot of African American um, communities are single-headed by women um, and a lot of that has to stem to ha goes back through um, slavery mm -hmm. and and, it, and it, it just made for a very very bad situation so um, our plight is different you know being you know fam single mothers and having to raise children and all of that different stuff so, you know, our injustices inflicted upon women are different as opposed to the injustices that were inflicted upon African-American men. Amen. So um, it's trying to find a, a common ground in order to, to come to, in order to come together, um, you know, um, in order for the real healing to, to come to pass. And I do know, you know, um, Martin Luther King, I mean, even Nelson Mandela, he was coined and went down in history as one of the greatest negotiation and one of the greatest negotiators in Earth on planet Earth. And he was from South Africa. And one of the one of the reasons why he was so successful, because he was able to get so many different people of all different nationalities together to come to one platform in order to effectuate change. And when asked of one of his secrets of how how are you great a negotiator he said you know what you got to learn to speak the language of the other party and when there's injustice and when there's racism the other each party have got to remember or learn to speak the language 
of the other person. So meaning putting themselves in their shoes to see how they are really affected. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think it's a disconnect, um, sometimes in the church, sometimes amongst uh, political leaders, civic leaders across the board to where um, we are, we can become so narrow minded and not really put ourselves in the shoe of the other person and develop um, greater empathy in order to effectuate um, great change. And one thing I know about oppression, um, we've seen it all throughout the Bible, all throughout, you know, even in history, that freedom is not free. Peace is never free. You know, Jesus Christ paid a high price for our freedom. So for us to be oblivious to that people won't use force to gain their freedom is foolish, you know? Um, now I'm not advocating, um, you know, bad behaviors or anything like that, but I'm just trying to get us to have an honest conversation of why sometimes um, protests go bad or why people tend to respond in a different demeanor that just because us that have a little bit more level of maturity do not. So, and, and I know uh, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, one of his, one of his quotes, you know, he said that, listen, um, freedom as, as voluntary and painful as it is, must be demanded by the oppressed. They cannot, you cannot expect the oppressor to give freedom. It has to be demanded by the person that's being oppressed. So if African Americans are being oppressed, then they have the right to demand their freedom um, from the oppressor, just like if it was any other different nationality. And I'm not saying go out and create or do senseless acts of violence. I'm not advocating that, but we really have to understand that their response, um, people's responses are, Mm, warn to if they, feel their level of oppression, if they feel as though their um, only means to get their oppression noticed um, could be, hey, taking it to the street, burning up a gas station, doing some stuff. You know, we saw in, in, in Florida and in Tampa last night, I, I was watching all the news and I saw how gas stations was being burned. They were going, they took their protest to malls and uh, you know, a lot of different things were happening on our watch. And I'm like, the church has got to do something a little bit different. Maybe we, we need to be the ones with the signs out showing people a more excellent way of how to, of how to protest or, you know, having private meetings in our local congregations, talking to our leaders, talking to leadership, talking to, you know, members of our congregation and saying, Hey, if you're going to organize a, organize a protest, this is how you do it or, you know, reaching out or speaking the language of the other party, reaching out to our city council members, reaching out to our mayors, reaching out to our governors, or, you know, those that are in leadership positions and say, hey, how can the church be a benefit? Because we want peace too. We want, we want change as well. It's not just the people that are marching on the street. So there's a lot of different avenues. I believe that us as leaders can, um, can, pr can promote peacefully. And I think the problem for so long is that we have been quiet and we want to stay behind closed doors and just pray. And I'm an advocate for prayer, but prayer without action is foolish. So um, I think that, you know, we have to get very, very granular, very, very practical about our approach to what is happening in the streets under our own watch, uh -huh. you know, um, and, and ask some hard questions. Get very, you know, very granular, not very, very practical about different our leaders to solve streets a under our own watch. That sometimes they are well, disconnected um, from because of because and, of race. And ask them hard questions. Their background. Very, very granular. So um, that is, you know, that's what I would say. Um, okay. Leadership. Let me, let me just add this leadership uh -huh. now in the 21st century, especially under the scope of the church has changed dramatically. We are not just responsible for equipping people spiritually. We are responsible for giving them a, you know, equipping in the area of, um, um, politics, uh, finances, 
um, social economic problems. You know, leadership looks so different now. It's not just about us taking our Bibles and praying and staying amongst ourselves. No, it's about us making our voices known in the community, backed by the power of prayer and to effectuate change for an entire city or entire country. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's different now and leaders and, and leaders have to step up to step up to the challenge. We have to step up to the challenge and uh, do some different things. Amen. Well, uh, you all know that uh, America is bleeding yes. and everybody's hurt. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, everybody is being very hurt. You know, I, mm -hmm. I don't believe that this is a matter a, of black against white and or white mm -hmm. uh, or, or Democrat against uh, Republican. It is just mm -hmm. a, a wound in, right. in, in, in the heart of the nation. And I do believe that almost all white people have black friends and all black people, are black Americans have white friends. Right. That's right. So I personally have uh, a lot of white friends and very, very wonderful, <laughs> wonderful people. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. It was, uh, um, so it is. We just have to address this properly. It is the the heart, the sin in the heart of man. Mm -hmm. And I believe the the laws, you know, of the land must be very strong against this kind of act. You know, it's on absolutely. This is something that nobody can understand. That the, this policeman. You know, after these, after all those videos, you know, no investigation is needed. You know, with all these video, all these facts, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the the action will have been quicker and, and very, 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 very uh, strong to, mm -hmm. to to send out a very strong signal mm -hmm. against Absolutely. racism. You know, because this is this is a, this is something that. So evil. So I believe that we need to pray. So I have a, a short, very short video here on mm -hmm. creating uh, the right atmosphere of prayer. Because uh, more than ever before, America need prayer. You know, we need absolutely, prayer absolutely absolutely for the healing of the heart. So let's just take a break as we listen to this uh, uh, this video. Creating the right atmosphere for prayer. Beloved, we all know in this end time that the order for survival given by the Lord Jesus Christ was an order of prayer. He said, watch therefore and pray always for you to be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man when he comes. So we know that in these end times, in these days, in this dark day, creating the right atmosphere for prayer. Beloved, we all know in this end time that the order for survival given by the Lord Jesus Christ was an order of prayer. He said, watch therefore and pray always for you to be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man when He comes. So we know that in these end times, in these days, in this dark age, there is nothing better we can do than pray. Many know that they ought to pray, but very few truly understand how to pray, what to pray, and what to expect every time we pray. But today I like to drop something again on prayer. You know, your real prayer doesn't start if you don't understand the art of worship and the art of praise and the art of thanksgiving. Those three things together, if you don't understand them, it is almost impossible to pray at your altar. The true prayer by faith comes, start by thanksgiving, move in praises, and then enters in worship. When you truly abide in the presence of God, in, in, with the combination of those three, then you can claim that you are rightly positioned for prayer. And if you want to spend time with God, you have to 
develop the art of worship, the art of praise, the art of things. Those are the requirements. Number one, the first requirement to open the gates of heaven is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving will open the gates of God. Praise is an invitation of the presence of God he cannot deny. Worship is entering into his glory. We have to develop these three art if you want to be addicted to prayer. If you don't want your prayer life to be bored, if you don't want to pray only because you know you have to pray, if you don't want to pray because Pastor Harold said you should pray all the time, if you want to pray and to make it as a lifestyle and to enjoy it into the fullness, the thing you have to do is to develop the art of thanksgiving, the art of praise and the art of worship. These three will create the spiritual atmosphere that will cause you to enjoy prayer. They will cause you to long after prayer. That will cause you to, to abide in the presence of God and not look at the time but just enjoy the presence of God. Worship simply means telling God who He is and how you feel about Him. Mm -hmm. That's it. Worship God. Praise is celebrating the act, the act of God. Worship is celebrating the nature of God. Thanksgiving is appreciating, acknowledging the works of God in your life. These three will create the spiritual atmosphere that will cause you to enjoy prayer. They've called you to long after prayer. Mm -hmm. These three will create the spiritual atmosphere. Amen. It makes me want to go in prayer. <laughs> yeah. Every single time, it just it just gets me all riled up all over again. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> oh my goodness! But yes, we are we are talking about racism and racism in America. And just so happened, Florida, Florida just, well, Tampa, you know, my city just started protesting um, yesterday and all throughout today. And, you know, we had some some good protests and we had some not so good protests. So, um, yeah, much better. And we had not so good protests. And so we're just having an unscripted conversation about racism in America, what we can do, what should be our call to action. I want to talk about what is our call to action? What, what practical, um, what can we employ practically for individuals um, that may, ex may have experienced racism or may experience racism, especially with the upheaval of all of these um, protests because of the death of George Floyd. And I, I wanna say something about what you said, Harold, um, with all of the social media that started the other day, um, you know, last week, it should have been a little swifter action. I, I do agree with that. Um, and I think that, you know, that would have appeased some of the, the hurt or the trauma um, that people were experiencing is it's just like a scab wound. You know, if you have, if you're cut and you got a, you know, a fresh scab on something and then you injure yourself again, right in that same exact spot without it being fully healed, the impact sometimes is, you know, or the recovery time is sometimes greater because it wasn't fully um, healed yet. And so we have seen time and time again, so many people that have lost their lives due to racism. And then George Floyd, um, that video that went viral just opened up a greater wound that was already here in America. And so it caused, it caused a lot of reaction, but I do believe that um, it should have been something a little bit more swifter. Now we know that he's, he, he was apprehended or arrested um, and still the, four, the other remaining officers are at large and um, people want answers. So I want to talk about a practical call to action. What can we do individually in our houses? And okay, our homes? go ahead. What can we do for the church? So talk to us about uh, a practical action. Yeah. What should we do? 
True story. And by the way, I have with me here Sorry. Perry Damon. He's a great producer. Uh, it's a wonderful man. This is an example of uh, good people. I mean, there is no place. I want to tell you, I travel a lot. There is no place on the face of the earth. I'd rather be than America. If I'm not in America, I go straight back to my back to my <laughs> native country. <laughs> I know that's right. yes. Yes. You know, it is true there is racism in America, but I can tell you, there's so many wonderful people in America. You will not even. I mean, the average American is just wonderful mm -hmm. person. Now, personally, Phenomenal. that's my personal that's experience. Right. So I've, I was watching um, many uh television foreign television channels and they were presenting america as if you know it's the worst the, the worst country in the world when it comes to racism and stuff like that no 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 mm -hmm. it is not true it is not true i can say that again and again the only the best place for a black man or woman to be on earth is america in terms yes. you know economically you know opportunities and everything it is still, you know, regardless of what is going on, we still have to keep that in mind. We have, we don't have to, we have to acknowledge the progress that has been made. You know, we can. It's unbelievable right. that you know, it's just few years back, we were still slaves over the land. You know, blacks were not mm -hmm. able to vote, and you know, it's a long way, but we still have racism, and we cannot downplay it. Amen well mm -hmm. um yes uh i had my uh perry wanted to say something is uh, uh from Kennesaw. okay uh, he said um yes he has some international friend asked me if he was saved they can't believe america is suffering like this yeah sad time indeed discussion like this can be helpful okay yeah we, we we just want to to talk about what people really don't like to talk about because we are politically correct in america mm -hmm. we are so mm -hmm. much scripted so we watch what we say so we polish the outside very well we're number one in the world in marketing so we know how to polish the, our outside <laughs> but uh, the inside this can only be taken care of mm. by the holy spirit by god by jesus christ so uh we still have racism mm. that is true we still we do have racism and it's not going anywhere soon so what should we do practical mm. measures to practical <laughs> measures <laughs> all right crystal oh, no i think wow. before uh, well, go ahead <laughs> Ahead, yes, sir. I think before we get to a uh, practical measure, uh, we have seen uh, an increasing in the number of the state that are protesting. So mm -hmm. I thought that it was one of the first things we had to do is how we can address or uh, what can be done so that people can calm down. Because as I was reading this morning, there are three people who lose their life because of this protest. It mm -hmm. means that there are two additional families who are mourning. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how many will happen tomorrow morning since protests uh, take place uh, in the night. So what can be done, uh, Apostle Krista, what can be done now? to calm people so that people can stay home and believing that they have been hurt and that action has been taken? Well, first, I believe that, um, let me speak for Tampa. Um, I saw on the, the, the news broadcast that our city leadership did come out and say city leadership as far as our mayor, um, Jane Castor, our um, chief of police, our sheriff um, was on live last night, Chad Cronister as well. Um, they came out and they addressed as immediately, as soon as um, the protests started turning violent, they came out and um, immediately address, addressed it. Um, not only addressed what was being done um, incorrectly, but they also address the George Floyd uh, 
situation and they went on record. It's very, very important for uh, civic leaders and community leaders to go on record about their stance. We, can, we cannot afford quiet. We have to know where people stand. And so they went on record to say, listen, we do not condone police brutality. We don't condone, we don't like what happened to George Floyd. And even the uh, police commissioner in Tampa said this morning um, at a press conference, he said, listen, he said, if that went, he felt very, very bad about stuff going down on his watch. But he said, listen, if that was me or some of his cadets or officers that did that, that and he just turned a blind eye, he said the mayor would have had him fired immediately. So, you know, I would say that if you are in a city or a community, your civic leaders, your public officials need to go out and voice their opinion, get on the front lines and say, hey, listen, this is where this is where I stand. Because, you know, um, you know what they say, first and foremost, silence breeds content. So if the church is silent, then that looks as though the church is condoning actions that yeah. may not necessarily be in our heart. So the church can't afford to be silent. Civic leaders cannot afford to be silent. Community leaders, um, your city council, your mayor, your sheriffs. So I would say that people need to start there. If they don't know where they stand, that's why they have, you know, telephones. Call them, you know, um, call them out in a, in, a, in, a, in a very, very respectful way. Hey, what does Tampa have to say about what's going on? What does uh, Atlanta, what do our, our leaders have to say about what is going on? And I think um, people can get behind um, transparent leadership across the board. I think first and foremost, that's something very, very practical. And then if we scope it down or scale it down to church leaders, we need to hear from the church leaders in your community, uh, especially mega pastors, mega leaders. What is their stance about what is going on? How are they comforting the, the people of the community? How are they comforting the people under their own um, watch or their own, uh, you know, their, their own sheep? You know, what, what, is, what is their stance? And I believe that it's, you know, as those that have a voice, you know, mega leaders, mega, uh, you know, mega, mega churches, if those that have a voice, it's their responsibility to reach out to civic leaders and to their local leadership and say, hey, how can we help? Um, can we have an open dialogue and get in front of, you know, all of this particular type of stuff, get in front of it. Don't just bury our head in the sand. Don't want to address the pink elephant <laughs> in the room, but get in front of it and ask, hey, how can we how can we um, aid in providing a platform for um, safe protest? And then our civic leaders also need to reach out to mega leaders that have a platform and need to go to church and be like, hey, OK, how can we facilitate some type of some type of bond, some type of unity? Um, in the community. And I think if we start, if we start there, uh, then we can have a lot of different people under our, wa our particular watches to follow suit um, and say, okay, well, if my leader is doing this, then, hey, maybe, maybe the church needs to, you know, perform a, perform a rally or something like that. You know, or if you have a smaller congregation, then group up with some some other congregations and y'all make a massive statement, but do it in safety. And then you can you know, you can talk to your uh, members or the, the people in your community, employ people in your community and say, hey, you know, pre plan something. Don't just do something off the cuff. Pre plan as much as you can. If I can say that if you're going to you know, go out tomorrow at one o'clock, then everybody has their particular um their particular uh, marching orders, reach out to local government, reach out to the police and say, hey, we want to plan a protest. OK, you know, here in Tampa, I heard our commissioners, uh, not commissioners, but our, our um, police department saying today, listen, they were right along the put right along the people that were protesting yesterday. They didn't you know, they were right along sides. So, you know, even if you want to plan something that reach out to the police and say, hey, this is what we want to do. I'm pretty sure that they would be more than able to oblige you or something like that. Um, and if not, then y'all know you have a bigger problem at hand. 
but I think that's practical, some practical steps that we can do. Um, also, you know, as spiritual leaders, I believe it's the responsibility to equip, um, not just on a spiritual level. Remember what I said, you know, our responsibility to know, okay, who are our people in office? What are, what are, what are they about? You know, go, go to some of the city council meetings. You know, um, I was privy to, to, uh, be connected to a, a awesome woman here in the, in the neighborhood and she hosts, um, um, tea and conversations. You know, she does it every so often where she invites local leaders that are either running for office or in office. And she invites and does a public forum, you know, and say, hey, these and there you get to rub elbows with your city leaders, knowing what they're about, what, you know, they, they get to hear from the community. Hey, this is the injustices that we are facing. And when I sat there and I saw that at my last meeting, I sat there and I said, oh, my goodness. And you know what? The sad part about it was I only saw one pastor in the room beside myself. One. Wow. Everyone else were community citizens. They didn't have congregations. They didn't, I only saw one other pastor in the room. And I said to myself, I said, my goodness, if, if the spiritual leaders don't even know what's going on in their communities, then how can we properly inform those that we are required to lead or required to equip. We cannot. It was only one other spiritual leader in the room beside myself. So, um, you know, we have to require, require different things from us at require different, um, things from leaders at this particular moment in time to address racism, you know, um, uh, is 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 your members of the congregation are they registered to vote if not then why not host your church as a place where people can come and register to vote you know there's so many different things that we can do in order to address um in order to address racism but we can't they can't hear our voice if we're not present if we're not counted present so you know i i will let um one of y'all chime in but um Hmm. It was really a really eye opener. Well, um, I like to. Uh, yesterday, I was watching the perfect storm of John Paul Jackson. About ten mm. years ago, I think twelve years ago, two thousand eight, uh, John Paul Jackson is a prophet of God who went to be with the Lord yes. already. Yes. And he had a vision mm -hmm. about this riot, and he specifically said in the perfect storm that this will start on. On, on um, you start seeing the manifestation of those prophecy in about ten years. So that was two thousand eight and two thousand. We are to twenty twenty right mm -hmm. now. So he said after mm -hmm. ten years from now. And when he was recording that, it was two thousand nine. So I believe that uh, we have to pay attention to the mm -hmm. prophecy. What is it that is going on in the spirit realm, and what? Right uh how should we address it if we understand what is truly going on if he actually saw it this riot and he it was so 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 profound and the details and mm -hmm. uh, um so what what can we say about um mm -hmm. about that because and i will encourage everyone to go and watch uh and watch that perfect storm of John Paul Jackson because mm -hmm. it's not only the mm -hmm. riots, but there's so many other things that are actually so coming things. already. Right. So many other things that are already here. And um, he also men mentioned the economic stuff, uh, everything. So, mm -hmm. according to you, what would be the reason why God will speak and show something is for us to be prepared? and to be ready prepared mm -hmm. of course no. you mentioned personal yeah. preparation and i know many uh dr Howard browning mm -hmm. uh, one day mm -hmm. gave guns to his church you know he distributed he gave mm -hmm. guns and what is your take on that what do you think about uh, christian <laughs> <laughs> well 
Christians. Um, <laughs> having their own guns. <laughs> As a matter of fact, do you get uh, or do you own a gun? No, I'm not gonna have no <laughs> Don't answer to the question, but um what do you what do you think? What is your take on that, you know, owning guns and stuff? Oh wow. Uh huh. Um, I do believe personally in the right to bear arms. I believe it was given to us by the Constitution, mm -hmm. and it is okay um, to own a gun. I, but I would say that we must do it the right way. Any person must do it the right way, um, meaning you have to go get licensed, you have to be taught, you have to be credentialed, you have to go and, um, <laughs> and go practice at the range. You know, me, myself, personally, I have done three out of the four. So I just have to get my, my license. But I have been to the range. I have to worry about my gun kit. Listen, I already know which gun I'm going to buy. Listen, seriously. And it is so, so awesome that my kids for Mother's Day, instead of taking me out to Outback and loan, you know, all that great stuff like that, which is good. I mean, they gave me money, too. But they, my youngest daughter says, Mom, um, we're going to take you to the gun range. I said, what? I couldn't believe it. It was like, yeah, yeah, we want to do something. So we're going to take you to the gun range. So that was their mother. This Mother's Day gift to their mom is to go. All three of us go. Let's practice. Let's practice um, shooting some guns. And, um, <laughs> you know, so Lista, you better not go to Crystal House unannounced. You know, you need to. <laughs> Spiritual leaders have got to be practical. We just cannot have our head in the sand, in the sky all the time. We have got to be practical, and um, it is okay. I do not agree. First of all, that um, you should get a gun just for um, with the wrong with the wrong mindset. Mm -hmm. Because I I believe that owning a gun or getting a gun or getting credentialed and doing it the legal way is the right thing to do only because I mm -hmm. have already looked at the perfect storm. I have all this stuff has been coming down the pipeline for years. And so I've just been privileged to know, um, you know, know some things that are coming down the pipeline. And I just use it as a form of preparation, not a form of revenge. Mm -hmm. It's a big difference. It's a form of it's a it's a it's a tool of preparation, not a tool of revenge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my heart is is right in that, and so I I believe um, leaders, uh, spiritual leaders, should you know tell um, their congregants, hey, if you are comfortable in your heart, go go get credential, get it the right way, and 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 you know. Get, get your concealed weapons license. It's ninety-seven dollars to get credential. Ninety-seven dollar investment to go legal. Okay, mm -hmm. I, we're not saying go rogue and buy stuff on the black street market and all this stuff. No, 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 no. I believe in doing things above above board. It's ninety-seven dollars to get your concealed weapons weapons license here in Florida. I'm not sure about any other state, but I know it's ninety-seven dollars here. So make the investment in yourself if it's going to bring an extra layer of security. Um, wow. I. I and go a step further single moms if you have children or even married women married families if you have sons and and daughters that are of age 18 and above listen that can get credential tell them to get credentialed it is okay when i went to the gun range of uh, the, the the sunday after mother's day do you not know when i walked in there do i saw young kids young kids there shooting mm. young mm. kids when i say young kids you can start i'm not sure about anybody else but here in florida and here in tampa you can go to the gun range as long as you you are eight years up eight years old and up you can shoot under the parental supervision of your parents and i said to myself i wow. said what are they teaching these kids at eight years old they had <laughs> one range that was for atfs that were for automatics and then they have one that was, you know, like for like nine millimeters and stuff like that. I could not believe it. 
But if these kids are being taught the right to bear arms from age eight, by the time they get to 18, they ain't playing with nobody. They're, they're being conditioned that, hey, owning a gun is owning a gun is the way to go. And I would yeah. I would like to say this, and I'm not prejudiced, okay? And I'm not I'm not promoting racism, but the Badama, I didn't see my my daughters and I were of the minority there. I'm gonna say like we, we were of the minority. I didn't see any of another another African American there at the gun range. Wow. I just didn't see. Wow. So, you know, uh, that was that was an eye opener to me. I said, okay, ninety seven dollars is worth the investment, not as a tool of revenge, but as a tool of of instruction because okay. we know what is coming down the what is coming down the pipeline. And if you go out and you have to protect yourself, what the number, the number one thing that I learned in my um, concealed weapons class or gun safety class class, the number one rule that the instructor said, he said, never pull your gun on anybody unless you plan to use it. So no playing around, no, old, you know, no, no, no. He said, do not pull your gun unless you plan to use it. And that stuck with me in my brain when we're not doing this to, to be playing around because lives matter before us and before God. So I think uh, the church got to get on the forefront of that, to be honest with you, you know? So I, I don't personally think there's nothing wrong with it, but I think we should educate people of the importance of why do we do, you have to know why your why behind everything. So that's what I would say. Lister, your take on guns? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I don't have that culture, but you know, it's a constitutional right. It's a constitutional right. I've been around uh, many pastors, many men of God, and I've even realized that for some of them, it's a. It means that he will tell you that uh, he loves guns. It doesn't have only one, it doesn't have only two, but for some of them, it was one of the best gifts you can give to them. You can <laughs> give them a that one they don't have yet. It will be a pleasure for them. So <laughs> it's a constitutional right, and I can understand. But as uh, Apostle uh, Crystal said, during the training, what she said is something extremely important that was the first time for me to to hear that that never pull the gun except you have planned to use it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it makes never the forgot it means that mm -hmm. you can go for the training be licensed have it at home but have in your mind that when you pull it it means that you can use it it means that you should not play with it. It That's means right. that you should not take it as if you wanted to frighten somebody. Mm -hmm. It means that you should take it only when it's necessary for you to use it. For protection. That's that right. That's what I understood from what uh, mm -hmm. Apostle Christa said. I didn't know it before. Mm -hmm. That's what they That's what they teach. And they said, you, because you're not pulling it to... Um, <laughs> to shoot somebody in <laughs> in the leg, <laughs> you pulling it because it's a life or death situation, and your life is at risk. Your you maybe your family members or something like that. You, it's, it's not for show, because lives matter. People people you know they could be here today, gone tomorrow. So you don't come with the premise of okay, well if I pull it, oh I'm just I'm just shooting it up in the air. I'm just gonna shoot you in your arm. No, they tell you when you plan to pull it, your aim your aim should be to kill and take someone out. That's it. So you don't pull it any other time. That's a lot of responsibility on a person's, on a person's mind. So I always have, have taught that even, you know, I have a grandson and he plays, you know, cops and robbers with guns and he'd be like, grandma, I shot you. I shot you. And I even at four correct him. I said, don't do that. Don't I tell my tell my daughter, don't let him just carelessly be like, oh, I shoot you. I shoot you. I understand they don't understand that, but I'm trying to prepare them for a generation that he got to grow up in. 
to whereas if he does have to get credential, he's not, his mind is not conditioned just to pull it out, just to, to be pulling it out. No, because you only, when you pull a gun, you pull it with the intent of, you only pull it to use it, mm -hmm. not to play. So I even do that to my grandson. All right, we are going to conclude this live today. Um, again, um, thank you, Crystal, for, for, for having us. Oh, thank um, you. America, oh, we have to stay positive. This is my, my, my thing. I just still believe mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've been one of the things I'm most grateful for is to to had uh, this opportunity to be to live in America. OK. And and uh, there is problem everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. We should um, do something about the problem that we have like racism but we should never forget that uh, for a black man <laughs> this is the best place to be on earth okay so and a black, and right. a black woman so <coughs> if not you go back to africa you know africa you know i'm, sorry, I'm talking about overseas if you know you go back to, to africa somewhere else you know, yeah like, I love you. I love America. so absolutely if you doubt what i say go to china and you come back and tell me go to mm -hmm. yeah it is is even to germany you know to europe you know mm -hmm. it's have mm -hmm. stronger racism now i think that um we we just like like we said this is not scripted we just wanted to pour out our heart we um we pray for the families affected yeah. in this um and we pray for peaceful protest you know and we, we we really believe we really hope that all these protests will bring something maybe a reform or something that will mm -hmm. prevent such things to happen to keep happening on the land uh, mm -hmm. this is uh, evil it's unacceptable it, it is a uh, killing actually what happened was a killing he was murdered mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And That's right. but the question I you know I kept asking myself you know there is what there's the brutality of the police okay everywhere in the world you have police brutality killing mm -hmm. shooting you know and everywhere in the world but mm -hmm. because we have this background of racism in America we can only understand this through the lenses of racism so we cannot um, I mean, that's the that's our his historical background. But I have seen in many places in the world, policemen shoot at someone on arm. No, we, with that, we, I mean, who, who doesn't represent any threat? It happens. The brutality of the police always happens. My father was the chief of the police, so I know so many cases, the abuse of power. You know, I know so many. Yeah, Sometimes it has nothing to do with the color, okay? It's just that some people are not fit to carry guns and to, to right. they are just not they are gangsters you know so sometimes it has nothing to do with uh, the color but uh, every time a black a, a, a you know a white man will kill a black white policeman kill a black we can only understand it that's how they should be trained that it can only be understood through the lenses mm -hmm. of racism but we still, I checked uh, Google last time, we still have a very heavy number of white cops killing white male as well. You know, so we have all these killings, the abuse of power. I think we have to think of, rethink the power that we give to police officers. You know, the, 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 it, it, uh, it's so quick, easy to take people's life. That is mm -hmm. a deeper problem from my point. Yeah. You know, we, we, we you don't see that in any other place but America, you know? So it, it's a very complex problem because we have people have guns here. You know? So it, it sometimes it's a matter of life of death because the, the policeman is sometimes, you know, it's, it, it's a real threat of his life. But mm -hmm. uh, to kill so easily unarmed people, I think is the evil in the heart of man. And, and evil in the heart a, of man, you hit yeah. it on the nose. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Elisto, do you want to say something to close before we get to Not before, yeah, before, uh, we before Crystal give us our proper closing? Yeah. 
I, I, I look at the video for the death of George, and one of the things I've noticed is that normally all the four police officers should have been arrested. Mm -hmm. So that is one of, I think, that if they have arrested all of them and how they have charged the first one, the first police, Derek, because they, they charged it in the third, I don't know how you call it. Third degree. Third, third, third degree. Third degree. Why mm -hmm. should have been charged at the first degree? I think mm -hmm. if they have charged it first degree and then arrest all the others three other police officers, I think it will have brought, I mean, peace in the heart of many protesters. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at the video, some videos, you'll notice that you have three police officers on the guy, on the floor, one on the neck, one on the stomach, and one on the legs. So I believe that in that specific case, that is one thing that has, had, I mean, just to calm down the population right now. And later on, we will see, as Pastor Crystal said, to bring down racism on the nation, we understood that the, the church has to address it. Because mm -hmm. um, uh, Patricia, she said something on Facebook. She said, we focus on love thinking magically hatred will go away. Whereas if we love one thing, if you love one thing, you must hate another. If we love sanctification, you must hate sin and any defilement. So as I was reading this one, it, what it came in my mind, that if we teach people how to love other, they should hate racism. It means that the church has to address it, really address mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Not just mm -hmm. thinking that uh, people just have to behave if you don't address it. So mm -hmm. I believe that beside, uh, beside what has to be done now, the church has to stand and address the problem of racism in the congregation. So that each mm -hmm. Christian has to examine his heart and right. truly find out if he really love other, because God says, love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself, right. Love your neighbor. Your neighbor can be every type of person. He can be a Muslim, he can be a Buddhist, he can be a black, he can be a whatsoever. God says you have to love him as you love yourself. It doesn't matter if he's Christian or not. It doesn't matter if you are from the same race. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think if they charge uh, correctly those officers, people will be, they will find out that there is a beginning of justice. And they will yeah, just yeah. calm them down. But if they don't do it, I believe because, you know, in many cities, as you said concerning Florida, who said who the mayor or the chief police officer said, if he has done something like that, the very first thing of the mayor to do the next day was to fire the person. That was the correct thing to do. But the most of mm -hmm. the time, the city will cover. You have seen on internet. But now he's saying that because it's not happening in Florida. It has happened in Florida. We had many cases in Florida. It, <laughs> it didn't happen that way, you know. We had the Floyd. What was the name of that guy again? Uh, he wasn't even a police officer. He Trevor killed Martin. Trevor Martin, you know. So it was even worse because he wasn't even a police officer. Yeah, yeah that was in Orlando. Yeah. yeah. We, had, uh, we had so many cases, you know. So we can't say. He can, he can say now to calm down people, but people will not believe that because it happened in Florida even more. You understand? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, I mean, it's a good thing to say. But it's something as me, I will have a hard time to believe that uh, that's exactly what's going to happen if it happened in Florida. You know, it, it, uh, for some reason, 
the the the, um, the mayor or the, the authorities they have problem to with the police they they have hard problem to convict or to charge any policeman any law enforcement mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is uh, they, they they behave like the supreme they are they are gods in the streets you know so they don't have account to good to to give to no one they can kill and walk away with no conscience can you imagine what was happening when there were no television when there were no uh media uh, social media the mm -hmm. way it is right now mm -hmm. can you imagine you know so it, it is terrible well yeah krista would you like to say something before we close i i just want to say that it does go back to the heart of man mm -hmm. um the heart of man is deceitfully wicked and you know from that root comes out all of these different issues. Racism is just one. Um, prejudicism is another. Poverty is another. So it's so many, we're, we're dealing at the, the root cause of um, mm, the inward manner of the heart for mankind. And that is what we have to spiritually address and then naturally address any um, anything that threatens um that threatens peace and uh, you know being civil with one another we leaders have to call it out and not tolerate it whether it's in your leadership whether it's in your congregation whether it's in your business it doesn't matter you have to you have to call it out um mm -hmm. you know and 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 then and, and go from there I, I thank you for the platform to have an honest, an honest conversation because, like I said, the protest just started yesterday here in Tampa. Um, and I am asking um, our spiritual leaders here in Tampa, if you're seeing this this live, please, let's, let's collaborate. Let's reach out, you know, to our local civic leaders. Let's come together and let's get in front of, of this um, situation so that way no other lives will have to be affected so let's work together um it's not about who's big who's small it's it's a crime against humanity when mm -hmm. innocent lives are lost due to the monster of racism so mm -hmm. and i just like to uh end with a quote from um dr martin luther king he said injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere mm -hmm. so all across america injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere and we cannot it, you know america can't be ensnared by this type of injustice because we wasn't built for that you know we were built mm -hmm. upon freedom so <clears throat> and i think you know that this is trying to come to divide us you know, on the base of race, where in all actual reality, and we were created equal in the sight of God. So um, that's really about all I want to say. If you know, if hopefully that this this gets on the ground of good people in the ears, and then we may have to have another conversation, and that's okay. That is but we have to progress forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, to all the, our viewers and listeners, I want to encourage you to what to. Uh, like our pages we will start mm -hmm. uh, very soon a series of programs in in english and one of those is perspective if we want to have a um, different perspective from the media you know sometime today people don't trust <laughs> medias anymore so we want to uh, give a different <laughs> different right. perspective mm -hmm. so uh if you want to like our pages on facebook youtube instagram and this is um this mm -hmm. are our pages We want to thank you all for 
viewing and listening today mm -hmm. and we want to encourage every one of you to stay in prayer for america this is uh, a problem that we are all facing in the nation it mm -hmm. is not a problem mm -hmm. of black or, or white it is not the republican against democrat it's not politically right. it's a nation problem so we have this uh, really big wound that we have to to heal and we have this problem that we need to address to be a greater we to be better but we as um, a nation we are better in terms of uh, racism blacks than anybody any other nation in the face of the planet uh, this we need to keep that in mind as well may god bless you richly i expect to see you next um when uh, we will have our next but please like like our pages and you will be notified and now we are working on preparing all these platform and scheduling for the different events and you will be notified if you like and subscribe to our pages god bless you richly and i see you the next uh